greetings uh, while we're getting our name tags straight and uh, uh, everyone is getting seated. I have been asked to ask everyone not to stream. So we're streaming this online for everyone. And so if you have your iPhone or Android, whatever, don't bother to stream. Uh, let the, uh, because uh, as the modern phenomena is, you look at the picture from upstairs and everybody's holding a camera. Uh, so please don't stream. I'm Askia Muhammad. I'm a news director at WPFW-FM. That's the Pacifica station here in Washington. I write a column for the Washington Informer newspaper here, and I'm a senior editor at the Final Call newspaper. I'd like to, as I introduce this distinguished panel, remind you of the one of the things I considered so important about this event. The event has collected what I would say are unimpeachable witnesses uh, to something that is an unspoken reality, an unspoken truth. And so just bear that in mind. The witnesses are unimpeachable. There are a couple of things I'd like to commend to your attention. Yesterday, April the 9th, was the 150th anniversary of the uh, surrender of the treasonous rebel leader, General Robert E. Lee, the, the Army of the Northern Virginia surrendered unconditionally to the United States Army led by Ulysses Grant. I say treasonous and traitorous because it was 110 years after General Lee's death before his citizenship in the United States of America, the US of A, was restored. They were in rebellion. They were uh, formed a armed uprising against the United States of America, which I think constitutes treason and traitor behavior. <clears throat> I mention that because at that, after this surrender unconditionally, it ushered in 100 years of American apartheid, um, which ended ostensibly with the passage of the Civil Rights Acts and the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. I use the word apartheid because a clone, and it was just referred to, of the United States of America, uh, the US of A, uh, the U of S A, uh, South Africa, really perfected the apartheid uh, regime and uh, brought it into existence. And it seemed even up until the presidency of Ronald Reagan that it might endure forever. But as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminds us, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. South African apartheid was dismantled. Today, President, former President Jimmy Carter says what no president, no sitting president can ever say, uh, and has, will say, uh, in the cover of his book, the title of his new book, uh, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. And when this question is raised, why are you calling this apartheid? Well, in some ways it is an apartheid state, although the population is 50-50. And if there were a one state solution, boy, uh, one person, one vote, uh, you'd have a questionable outcome. Nevertheless, the arc of the moral universe is long. It bends toward justice. This event today is a witness of that because I think I heard uh, uh, Grant Smith say this a similar event was organized a few months ago and about one fourth the participants were here. And so this is growing, the BDS movement is growing. And so uh, prepare to understand that um, you are not alone. <clears throat> the uh, guests I'm going to introduce, and I guess we'll have them speak in alphabetical order again, unimpeachable. Please allow me to uh, present for his remarks uh, Richard Anderson Falk. He is a professor emeritus. <laughs> of international law at Princeton University. Ah, which reminds me of the final quote I'd like to share with you on April the 9th. And uh, it, April the 9th is the, which again reminds us of the, 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 the veracity and the, and the, the eventual, um, success of this event uh, or, or this cause, this movement. 
On April 9th in 1898, Paul Robeson, world citizen, was born in Princeton University, where Professor Falk was a, is a emeritus professor. Uh, his, he made a statement which uh, certainly speaks to this event. Quote, the answer to injustice is not to silence the critic, but to end the injustice. In the words of Paul Robeson. <clears throat> Professor Falk is a, a professor emeritus. He's the author and co-author of 20 books and the co-editor of the 20 volumes including Achieving Human Rights, Israel, Palestine, on record. Uh, he has also a, served for uh, several years from 2008 to 2014 as the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. Please welcome our first unimpeachable witness. Alarming, but uh, let me first say that I'm uh, honored and happy to be part of this important event and thank the conveners for bringing us together. It's, it's, it reveals the two sides of the present uh, reality that should be both encouraging and disturbing. The one side being that there are growing voices that seek justice and peace for both peoples. And this kind of gathering, I think, is an affirmation of that. But it's also true, as Jeff Blankford reminded us, uh, that there's a dreadful asymmetry in the way in which the public is informed about these realities. The media, uh, indulges in a kind of feasting whenever they get the opportunity to celebrate uh, pro-Israeli uh, happenings, and they practice the opposite in relation to any kind of balanced inquiry into the realities of the conflict. And we must keep both of those realities in mind if we are to understand the situation correctly. Uh, there are no better texts for assessing the damage done to the role and reputation of the United Nations by the Israeli lobby than Secretary of State John Kerry's recent statements about efforts within the UN by the US to protect Israel from the fulfillment of its responsibilities under international law and in relation to the UN. Uh, despite the recent tensions arising over the Netanyahu speech to Congress, Kerry boasted almost at the same time on ABC News, quote, we have intervened on Israel's behalf a couple of hundred times in over 75 different fora within the UN. And when addressing the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Kerry included a statement that could have been drafted by APEC or Israel's ambassador at the UN when he said, it must be said that the Human Rights Council's obsession with Israel actually risks undermining the credibility of the entire organization. And further, we will oppose any effort by any group or participant in the UN system to arbitrarily and re regularly delegitimize or isolate Israel, not just in the Human Rights Council, but wherever it occurs. What is striking about such statements by our highest ranking government officials dealing with foreign policy 
is the disconnect between these unconditional, uh, the, between this unconditional support and Israel's record of disregard for its obligations under international law and with respect to the authority of the United Nations. When speaking uh, in, at the March APAC uh, meetings, uh, Representative Lindsey Graham went even further when he told the audience uh, that when, he, when serving as chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, I'm gonna put the UN on notice that I will go after the UN funding if the organization takes any steps to marginalize Israel. During my six years as UN Special Rapporteur for Occupied Palestine, I had the opportunity to observe the manner in which international and national so-called NGOs give pri priority uh, to discrediting those uh, who offer any critical assessment of Israel's conduct. And it's, uh, these are so-called uh, NGOs because they're so closely aligned uh, with the governmental priorities and viewpoints of Israel that they should be really known as quasi-governmental organizations. And I think of UN Watch and others in that uh, category. There are really two ways that this effort to uh, devalue and discredit uh, the UN and its uh, activities takes place. One is to attack individuals, and the other is to attack the organization itself. Uh, most uh, consistently, a reliance on defamatory attacks on the critics as biased and even anti-Semitic whenever someone describing Israeli violations of international uh, uh, law or sympathetically reporting on uh, Palestinian grievances. Coupled with this kind of personal attack is an avoidance of substantive aspects as to whether the criticisms or grievances are well-founded from the perspective of international law and human rights law. In other words, these, at these defamatory attacks are disassociated from whether their substance is grounded in fact and reasonable interpretations of uh, relevant law. <clears throat> Even those uh, defamatory attacks, at least in my case, focused on distorted presentations of my views on a variety of issues that were made in settings other than the UN and did not pertain to the Israeli-Palestine uh, conflict. The intended, the intended effect was to shift attention from the messenger uh, containing uh, these uh, issues uh, to the uh, message itself. In other words, uh, instead of uh, focusing on the message, the hope was to generate a controversy about a disreputable messenger. With incredible persistence, UN Watch in particular circulated their defamatory attacks to prominent international personalities, including high-ranking civil servants in the UN itself, uh, such as the UN Secretary General and the High Commissioner for Human Rights and a variety of ambassadors uh, of countries friendly to Israel. What was particularly disturbing uh, to me was the extent to which these defamatory attacks were treated without examination as credible by supposedly responsible officials here in Washington 
and New York, who didn't even bother to check with me or with the sources that were being relied upon and led uh, to the endorsement of such uh, defamation in ways damaging to my reputation, but more significantly, diverting attention uh, from the substance of Israeli uncontestable violations of fundamental international law and human rights law. And that's the, it's what I call the politics of deflection. Instead of talking about the real issues that should be discussed within the UN, the effort is to get people to talk about whether a particular person is an anti-Semite or is uh, in some way uh, biased. And it's, it doesn't rest on any facts. It rests on the repetition of the defamation. And if you repeat, as Joseph Goebbels understood very well, if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes a kind of publicly accepted truth. And, and that's where the, uh, I think, uh, very destructive effect of this kind of tactics occurred. Mentioning just one incident uh, that is illustrative of a much broader pattern, the UN Secretary General, uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, denounced me as uh, biased, even using the word as despicable, uh, with reference to opinions that had nothing to do with my role as special rapporteur, but referred to uh, distortions of what I had said about 9-11 uh, uh, attacks and about the uh, 2013 uh, Boston Marathon bombing. After the first of these t attacks, I tried to find out uh, why a uh, the Secretary General would launch such an attack uh, on someone within the organization. Uh, and I was told by his uh, aide de camp that they didn't, as he put it, do due diligence, which means they didn't read uh, what it was, what I supposedly said. And uh, besides, they were under pressure from the US Congress to show that they were not anti-Israeli. And it was at a time when Ban Ki-moon was running for a second term as Secretary General. So one sees the insidious way in which these uh, political maneuvers uh, play out. And it's sort of reminiscent of the Soviet system where the leadership reaches out to some lowly individual like myself in order to uh, demonstrate a kind of larger uh, political reality. Uh, what I'm trying to explain by these references to my experience is the degree to which uh, these uh, quasi-NGOs stir up trouble uh, for those seeking to document allegations concerning Israel's violation and actually weaken uh, the way in which uh, the organization can function on behalf of the international community and the, uh, promoting uh, what I think uh, one would hope would be the global interests rather than merely succumbing to the national interests of the most powerful uh, members of the organization. And uh, one of the uh, uh, most disturbing uh, features of this is the degree to which the US um, ambassadors at the UN swallow what uh, UN Watch and uh, uh, NGO Monitor both uh, kind of quasi-governmental organizations, what they uh, feed them. And uh, again, in my case, uh, Susan Rice and Samantha Power, uh, both of whom uh, know better, uh, just routinely repeated the kind of uh, denunciations and defamations 
that, I, that were associated uh, with these attacks. Uh, the uh, second approach used uh, on behalf of Israel to weaken and discredit the UN involves uh, trying to both manipulate the organization and to undermine it at the same time. It, it's a very uh, sophisticated kind of uh, relationship to the UN uh, that Israel has. It, it both pretends to be victimized by the organization, and yet it, because of its uh, relationship to the US and its uh, clever uh, use of these kind of tactics, it intimidates the organization more than any other government, however large or small. It's a kind of uh, tour de force of a negative variety that it is able, despite being so uncooperative, uh, to be able to uh, impose its views. And the UN is, not, rather than being biased, it leans over backward in every particular context to make sure that uh, Israel's uh, best arguments are made uh, fully available and given uh, as much attention as possible. In other words, the reality is just the opposite of the uh, perception in this country. If anything, the organization could be criticized as being uh, 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 indifferent to the Palestinian uh, reality and uh, biased toward not offending Israel. It's, it's quite uh, an amazing uh, manipulation of uh, the reality, at least as uh, I experienced and understood it. Uh, and uh, there was a recent speech by the Israeli ambassador, uh, Ron uh, Prosser, uh, that uh, spoke of the, U that the tide of hatred aimed at Israel within the UN. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, language uh, is used to influence the atmosphere here in Washington and the Congress. And it's a sad commentary on the state of our democracy uh, that so many of our elected representatives swallow this central lie about the UN, an organization the world desperately needs to be strong and effective, uh, because of these kind of uh, defamatory uh, tactics. Uh, reflecting, uh, rather than the UN reflecting the supposed hostility of oppressive regimes to Israel, the UN has increasingly uh, been neutralized in any effort to produce a sustainable uh, peace uh, that is just for both peoples. One forgets that it is the UN that failed the Palestinian people uh, when the British uh, gave up their colonial mandate and dump the future of Palestine into the hands of the UN. It's unlike any other place in the world as far as UN responsibility is concerned. And so, again, the criticism that, the, that Kerry makes, made and others, that the UN devotes a, a disproportionate attention uh, to uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict is really the reverse of what it should be doing. And that is, it sh for uh, over 65 years, it's failed to realize the right of self-determination for the Palestinian people that every other major people in the world has enjoyed and achieved. And,
And it, it's, we, it's, it's, we have reached a time when we should expect and demand of not only the US government, but of the international community, uh, that it fulfills this long uh, neglected responsibility uh, and, not, uh, and not to uh, overlook the present realities of both peoples and the mistakes of the past, but to, to create some kind of future uh, that is viable for both peoples. My time is rapidly elapsing, more rapidly than my text, unfortunately. Uh, but let me just say the following, that Palestine may be winning the legitimacy war being waged throughout the world and at the United Nations to obtain popular support for the Palestinian cause with the peoples of the world. But it is continuing to lose the geopolitical war that is being waged within the organization. And it's very important to keep these two wars in mind. The, the, the legitimacy war is a war waged by people to achieve rights and justice. The geopolitical war is uh, being waged by powerful governmental forces linked to powerful economic forces that seek to, uh, to sustain unjust structures of authority and power. Let me stop there and thank you for your patience. Dr. Richard Falk, please. As a radio person, I'm not often conscious of the optics, and so I'll stand for my photo op. <laughs> if you have questions, uh, there are cards. You probably have cards. You can write the questions on cards. And, and uh, if you hold them up, I will uh, circulate, or someone will circulate and pick them up. Our next speaker out of the photo op mode is a Boston-based physician and author and filmmaker and an activist. Um, Dr. Falk mentioned the defamatory tactics, and one defamatory tactic with which we're all familiar is labeling someone an anti-Semite. Another, which has not been used as often as it was maybe 20 years ago, is to label someone a self-hating Jew. Dr. Alice Rothschild is involved um, for, in the act Activities for Human Rights and Social Justice in the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. She's an active member of Jewish Voices for Peace, American Jews for a Just Peace, the Workmen's Circle Mideast Working Group, and um, she has been organizing health and human rights delegations to Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza since 2003. Please welcome Dr. Alice Rothschild. Thank you so much. I just got back from Gaza three days ago, if I'm a little verklempt, as we say. So um, first of all, I want to talk about what silencing looks like. Uh, it kind of overlaps with active muzzling, with a strict framing of the dominant paradigm. Um, it involves a widespread systemic intolerance of alternative framing. Silencing challenges free speech, rights of protest, it's all about power, about fear, and about the broad cultural and political assumptions in the world that we live. So I'm gonna first speak from my uh, personal experiences as a self-hating Jew, as you mentioned. Um, in 2004, I had come back from the region and I wanted to do Grand Rounds and I was invited to Cambridge Hospital to speak on the impact of war and occupation on civilians. And um, before my presentation, one of my colleagues came and leafleted the auditorium with these horrific pictures of Jews who'd been blown up by suicide bombers. And after my presentation, he got up and harangued me for 10 minutes, accusing me 
of lack of compassion for Jews. Um, I wanted to do uh, you know, a similar kind of uh, discussion uh, about healthcare and occupation in my own hospital. I was told by my department chief that I was, quote, a danger to the Jewish people. It took five years in his leaving and I kept trying to do my talk and finally they said yes. Uh, my talk was announced and they received 100 emails protesting my giving these grand rounds. And I had to take the word occupation outside of the title of my talk and I was told to stay away from politics. So fast forwarding the last year and a half, I've been doing a lot of book touring with my two books and my film and doing a lot of presentations. So I've been bumping up against a lot of muzzling. So in the academic setting, I was at American University and I was talking with students who found that they, if they focused on human rights, on opposition to occupation, supporting BDS, et cetera, they found themselves marginalized and accused of bias. They described a campus that was polarized with no conversation between the right and the left. Um, two professors had been uh, included in the list of professors who are dangerous to Israel, and one untendered, untenured faculty member talked about being warned to limit his comments, critical comments about Israel because it would endanger his future career. At John Carroll University at a political science class called Peacemaking in the Palestine-Israel Conflict, there were complaints from the local Hillel stating that Jewish students on campus did not, quote, feel safe, having me on campus, and I hit that a lot, that I make students feel unsafe. And they actually had a major meeting of the faculty to determine whether I could be allowed on campus, which I was. And uh, the most disturbing part of that um, little event was um, at the end, the Israeli Shalicha, which is um, an ambassador that the Israeli government sends out to schools and temples and things like like that to you know, do Israel messaging. And she basically came up to me in front of all the people and started screaming at me, attacking me as a liar, doing a great disservice to the Jewish people, and just being a general bully, which was kind of an interesting experience. At the University of Maryland at an Arab media class, uh, one Jewish student told the professor after I spoke that he was very unhappy with my presentation, he was disappointed in the professor, he accused me of hate speech, and he said he felt offended as a member of Hillel. Um, at the University of Virginia at a book club, I was doing a book reading and several alumni complained and took it all the way to the president of the university that I should not be allowed to read from my book and then threatened to withhold funds since I was allowed. Um, when I've been in more religious institutions, there's a church in our DC suburbs that shares a building with a temple. They've had a long positive relationship. And the rabbi told uh, the minister there that if he showed my film, that he would sever their relationship. Um, there was a church in Vermont with a very uh, wonderful pastor who works a lot, does a lot of work with a progressive except Palestine rabbi who um, really pushed him hard when he invited me to the church and I saw the emails and the tone of the emails were, I'm profoundly disappointed in you, we've worked together for, on all, many, all these issues, I thought I could trust you and now you are showing this anti-Semitic one-sided film from this known self-hating Jew. Um, when I try to speak in temples, that's like getting up against the wall of McCarthyism. Uh, but I've had a couple of little uh, successes. Uh, there was a reformed temple in Ithaca, which I found that whenever they have announcements about speakers like me, the person who does the newsletter puts a little disclaimer saying, this does not represent the um, opinions of the temple. Um, and I also found as I made my rounds of the few temples that would let me in, is that their maps of Israel are all the greater Israel, including all the occupied territory. So that was sort of fascinating to find out. I was invited to an Orthodox synagogue in DC by an uh, Orthodox human rights lawyer who's also a Hebrew school teacher there. We set up the film and the rabbi canceled it. Um, at the Greater Jewish Community, I was in Sacramento. There's a Jewish Federation newspaper called Jewish Voice. Uh, for two times in a row, they've refused to publish an announcement that I'm in town, once doing a book reading, once showing my film, because they say that I am anti-Israel. In a Jewish community, in a public uh, library in uh, Ohio, I had this totally conflicted, agonized audience. They were completely unaware of the many millions of dollars that are being spent on Israeli Hasbara and the aggressive um, excuse me, control of Israel messaging. And one woman got up and she said, we could have this open conversation anywhere in the United States, but in Arab countries, we would be censored, arrested, and sold into sex slavery. 
I pointed out that actually I cannot have this conversation anywhere in the United States. In fact, I can't have this conversation in most temples, Hillel's, and Jewish community centers. She then pointed out that the poster for my talk was very offensive because it had the word conflict in it and a picture of the separation wall. So she said, it says what side you're on. Uh, the most disturbing point in this very interesting public library came at the end when a little old lady comes up to the poor woman who's selling my books and announced in a very loud voice that my book should be burned, at which point a gentleman standing behind her said, that's what they did in Nazi Germany. Um, and last February, <laughs> Last February, I was um, leaving New York City, and I saw this huge billboard, I don't know if you've seen it, that says, uh, New York Times against Israel, all rent, all slant, stop the bias. This is sponsored by the wonderfully well-funded and ironically misnamed Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America. So silencing can be both active, and it also comes through how we frame uh, the issues and the language, and what are the assumptions behind it. So going back to that uh, temple in Ithaca, um, the, one of the mahers in the Jewish community challenged me on my maps, and she basically said, you know, the Arabs were the migrants, and as she said, the last independent indigenous nation was 2,000 years ago, and she referred me to a right-wing blog for accurate information. Um, I was at World Fellowship in New Hampshire, which is a wonderful family camp for progressives, and a woman in the audience told me this amazing story. Her child was attending public school in the New York City school system, and they were studying indigenous peoples. And as an example, the teacher stated that the Jews were the indigenous people and the Palestinians were treating them badly. So the daughter, being her daughter, piped up and she said, no, 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 it's really you know, the other way around. And the girl was sent out of class to the principal's office. Her parents were called in and they were given a stern warning about that kind of talk. And when the mother agreed with the daughter, the principal actually said that that version of history is not allowed in the New York City school system. And just recently I got this award from my town in Brookline for social justice work on Israel-Palestine. And uh, both of the elected officials in the Massachusetts legislature boycotted the event. They're usually presenting the awards, and one funder pulled out. So that's what you see in your community. If we look at the issue of framing and language, you know, the framing is the Jews are good, the Arabs are bad, and you think about the visuals. You know, in our newspapers, there's a tendency towards the sympathetic Jewish settler mother crying over her injured child and the young man wrapped in a keffiyeh throwing a rock. That's the two visuals you see. And so there's an emotional message in our uh, media that rarely portrays Palestinians as fellow human beings who may actually have some incredibly legitimate grievances and who actually are rarely violent. So Palestinians are never seen as the most educated group in the Arab world. Who, they're never seen as the people with a long tradition of nonviolent resistance. You just don't see that. And so the question is, why is history that? Because history in our world is really a creation of groupthink. And if you go back in history, for decades, um, Palestinian history, trauma, aspirations, rights, have been really invisible in Western discourse. I think it's partly a reflection of our own racism towards Arabs, our Islamophobia, guilt about the Holocaust, and manipulation by Zionist leaders, and then we add in cultural, economic, and military imperialism. So how far does this go back? Well, there was early silencing of the Palestinian experience by US Zionists in the 1940s and the 1950s. So even back then, you would be viciously attacked if you criticized the partition plan, if you criticized Jewish nationalism and all that kind of stuff, or you mentioned that there was a Palestinian uh, tragedy. And so journalists were accused of anti-Semitism, they were threatened, politicians were threatened with loss of financial support. I mean, this goes way back to the founding of Israel. And then, as was mentioned, in 1974, the Anti-Defamation League uh, officially defined what they called the new anti-Semitism as criticism of Israel. And 10 years Years later, APAC issued this college guide um, exposing the, quote, anti-Israel campaign on campus, which they still think is going on, um, and basically was trying to tell students why they shouldn't listen to people who are critical of Israel because they're all obviously foreign terrorists and anti-Semitic. So you see this kind of McCarthyism crept into Jewish institutions, and the epithet of anti-Semitism has been used ever since to silence and demonize critical
multicultural voices. Uh, the Israelis joined in the fray with the Herzliya Conference in 2010, where they had a whole session on winning the battle of the narrative, and it's all about rebranding. It's a PR problem. And then a year later, the Raut Institute in Tel Aviv, it's a think tank, issued a position paper laying out the strategy of, quote, naming and shaming those on the left who are critical of their of various things. And the important thing is that they um, identified a strategy to engage uh, Jewish institutions and individuals, to identify and marginalize groups, to separate medium-sized liberals from more critical liberals, and to create this Israeli brand. And you also see at that point the word, uh, the people, they go against people who are delegitimizing Israel. So that's another clue. Cl you know, word that comes up. So what's happening now is a direct result of those kinds of policy decisions. People talk about shielding Israel from the abuse of human rights law. And then in 2011, uh, Haaretz reported that there was actually an Israeli military intelligence unit that was created to monitor folks like us. So in academia, we have Hillel International, which is the umbrella organization for the Hillel chapters on American campuses. It did start out not as a Zionist organization, but it's basically become an Israel advocacy organization. And despite you know, um, espousing pluralism and tolerance, they actually have very strict guidelines about what you're allowed to talk about and what kind of speakers you're allowed to have. And in December of 2014, Hillel International and the Simon Wiesenthal Center developed a new campus surveillance surveillance tool, which is a phone app, to fight anti-Semitism, which will be deployed on 550 US campuses with Hillel centers. And it's supposed to report students and professors of, who are being anti-Semitic, and they call it See It and Report It. Um, the Anti-Defamation League uh, last December also published a list, a blacklist of uh, those who have linked what's going on in Ferguson with what's going on in Palestine. And also, as was mentioned, there have been more than 6,000 US police trained in Israeli police and military units, and this is funded by the ADL. It's also funded by JINZA, which is another group to watch, the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. And you may not know that the New York City Police Department now has a branch in Tel Aviv. So we now have our police emulating the Israeli Defense Forces. We have academics being monitored and attacked. We have university donors pressuring administrators. We have groups sympathetic to Palestinians being confronted with lies. And I suggest you um, Google Hamas on campus. It's a really interesting YouTube. And um, then people are emotionally blacklisted and you know, called anti-Semitic. Now, in the Jewish community, there's actually a tremendous conflict because Jews have traditionally been more left-wing on every other right but Palestine. Um, and many of us, particularly people under 35, which obviously doesn't include me, feel that we are being asked to suspend our love of justice, democracy, and fighting for the oppressed when it comes to Israel-Palestine. And we see very right-wing forces, Campus Watch, Stand With Us, Camera, APAC, David Project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, aligned with the Christian right, lobbying Congress to support the most right-wing governments in Israel. I call this our own US branch of the Likud. And then we have muzzling of dissent and tolerance in our own community. So these assumptions are um, reinforced. Um, you know, The Jews are the good people, Arabs are the bad people, Jews are like us, they're white people creating a Western-style state in a savage, untamed region of the world. So after 67, there was this move towards making uncritical support of Israel the cornerstone of being a good Jew. And so being a Jew and a Zionist are now merged and Israel is the religion. Christian Zionists marched up and embraced the idea we all got to return so we can have an apocalypse, so they embraced the settler movement. Liberal Christians then bought the mythology. The US government developed our huge military industrial complex. And with this framing, the history and trauma and aspirations of Palestinians becomes more and more invisible. So this manipulation happens by controlling the message. And how is that done? We have birthright trips, which are basically brainwashing. We have students that have been recruited, and I've heard paid, to use uh, social media to uh, compliment Israel. They call this public diplomacy. There are a ton of free junkets for all kinds of people, ranging from academics to food and wine critics to go to Israel. Um, we have all the academic collaborations. We have our uh, Israeli ambassadors in all sorts of Jewish settings enforcing what the messages. And so there is this multi-million dollar industry to brand Israel with pinkwashing, greenwashing, um, faithwashing, all those kind of things. 
The good news is that there is pushback. There is a lot of pushback towards greenwashing and pinkwashing and faithwashing, and if you don't know what it is, just ask me. And there's also pushback within the Jewish community. Um, we are not monolithic. More than 50% of Jews in America, particularly those under 35, have no interest in Israel or feel some sympathy for Palestinians. And the interesting thing for me as a, you know, confirmed secular Jew is that many groups are questioning all of this framing using Jewish values and doing it in the name of Jewish religion. So I have young uh, students telling me Zionism has hijacked Judaism. And we keep mentioning Jewish Voice for Peace. This is an example of, of the growth of one of those kinds of groups. We tripled in size during the Gaza war. Um, a group called If Not Now came out during the Gaza War demanding that Jewish communal organizations recognize the Gaza dead. We have the Open Hillel Movement, which is demanding that Hillels um, do not uh, monitor and have these red lines, and these kids are having these conferences, breaking all the rules, talking about BDS in Hillels, and it actually did happen uh, just in February at Harvard. Um, three civil rights leaders from the 60s got up and talked about BDS at Harvard Hillel, and we all were very happy. The other thing that you're seeing is what, what I call an increase in intersectionality, so that there are unified coalitions forming between students of color, um, Muslim students from colonized countries, queer and trans students, feminists, all seeing the links between the oppressions of Palestinians and their own oppressions. So in conclusion, because I'm going to get this in 15, 18 minutes, um, what is happening to Jews and their allies is a loud battle about the meaning and understanding of history. We're separating Judaism, the religion, from Zionism, the national political movement. We are making a call to define a Jew as someone grounded in religion or culture or history, a set of ethics, a sense of peoplehood, and all these definitions are equally compelling. It does not matter if you're in the diaspora, you know, because Israeli Jews think us diaspora Jews are not really first-rate Jews. And so diaspora Jews are really reclaiming our legitimacy and our voice as Jews. There's a delineation of the racist ideology of anti-Semitism from thoughtful moral criticism of the policies of the country of Israel, and the treatment and solidarity of Palestinians has now become the civil rights movement of our day. We see major challenges um, such as the boycott divestment sanction movement, the campus uh, open Hillel, Students for Justice in Palestine, et cetera. We have African-American civil rights leaders embracing this issue and drawing parallels with our civil rights struggles. And with all of the increased amount of information that we ha now have access to, you really can't hide reality anymore. And I would like to propose that the intensity of the backlash and the muzzling may also reflect that the mainstream and right-wing forces are feeling increasingly cornered. Their positions are less defensible, and perhaps this is the beginning of a major turning point in the long struggle for justice in Israel-Palestine. Thank you. Dr. Alice Rothschild, the civil rights movement of our day, she defines what we are witnessing. A generation ago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said again, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The final speaker on this panel is an acclaimed author and media critic. Uh, he's a filmmaker who's Writings illustrate that the damaging racial and ethnic stereotypes of Arabs, blacks, and others injure innocent people. Dr. Jack Shaheen is a distinguished visiting scholar at New York University. He served as a CBS News consultant, how do you ever get that job, on Middle East affairs, <laughs> and as a professional film consultant. Please welcome Dr. Jack Shaheen. Uh, Richard Goebbels would probably use the Arab proverb, by repetition, even a donkey learns, uh, to initiate his propaganda. And Alice, um, Israeli, Jew equal good, uh, Arab, Muslim equal evil, is the subject of my brief comments this morning. I want to thank you. Let me start with another Arab proverb. 
one hand alone does not clap. And I'm very humbled and honored to be here with my Jewish and Israeli colleagues uh, who receive criticism from both sides. Uh, and I think it's real, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's just good to be together to kind of work towards peace and to bring people together. Um, one more quote, Sophocles, I'll paraphrase Sophocles. Those who tell the stories rule society. And Jack Valente, Washington, former president of the Motion Picture Association of America. Washington and Hollywood spring from the same DNA. Yeah, so I, you know, and, and finally, the last quote, my wife loves it when I use quotes, so uh, you have to either blame her or credit her, all right? It is, while I was walking in the hall, I saw this terrific photograph of my hero when I was a young man teaching documentary film, Edward R. Murrow. And Murrow's great quote, though, What we do not see is as important, if not more important, than what we do see. And I sincerely hope someone would send that message to C-SPAN, <laughs> because they're not here today. <laughs> uh, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about uh, a little, and, 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 and believe me, there are wonderful Israeli filmmakers that do not do what the Israeli filmmakers I'm talking about today do. I, I want to start with a uh, gold, Menachem Gold and Yoram Globus, uh, who in the 1980s bought a motion picture company called Canon Films. And they churned out dozens of films that vilified Arabs and Muslims. And no one really wrote about this or discussed this. And the only person to bring it to light was my friend Arthur Lord, who's since passed on, a Jewish American who worked for NBC News. And he did a special for NBC on the Today Show and received just hundreds of hate mails. But I thought, you know, to get things started, liven it up, would show a quick clip of some Golan and Globus films, plus a few others. And then I'll move on to television and we'll wrap it up. So can we show the glow, Golan Globus? Another way we can look at the connection between politics and entertainment, Washington and Hollywood, is the manner in which historically cinema has projected the Palestinian people. Since the founding of the State of Israel in 1948, our support has never wavered. Every American administration has made it clear whose side we're on. In contrast, Washington's policymakers have failed to support the millions of Palestinians who have been made refugees and who have lived lives of poverty and squalor as a result, while policies impact opinions. So equally unjust is how Hollywood has presented the conflict. Movies repeatedly depict Palestinians as terrorists, making it seem that all Palestinians are evil. Made in America, Colonel. Now that image has been perpetuated by Hollywood films, beginning with the film Exodus. It dealt with the very early conflict. Here, Palestinians are either invisible or they're linked with Nazis, perpetrators of horrific acts. The 1966 movie, Cast a Giant Shadow, is another early film presenting Israelis as innocent victims of Palestinian violence. Kirk Douglas is an American military specialist, and he goes to assist the Israelis. Some of the dialogue in this film reads like it came straight from the public relations department of the Israeli government. Now here's a country surrounded by five Arab nations ready to shove them into the Mediterranean. No guns, no tanks, no friends, nothing. People fighting with their bare hands for a little piece of desert. The Palestinians in this movie are the lowest of the low. We see them solely as vicious gunmen, wide-eyed maniacs. They will kill anyone, anywhere, anytime, for any reason. There's one brutal image in particular. 
of a burnt-out bus with a dead Jewish woman tied to its side, with the Star of David carved into her back. And when the Palestinians finally speak, they mock and psychologically terrorize another woman trapped in a bus. Well, if we jump forward a decade to the film Black Sunday, the Palestinian terrorist is now a woman. Striking where it hurts them most, where they feel most at home. She flies the Goodyear blimp into a Miami stadium and tries to wipe out 80,000 Americans at the Super Bowl. She cold-bloodedly eliminates anyone in her path. The movies that we see basically follow Washington's policies. It's reflected in the cinema over and over again, particularly during the 1980s and the 90s, where you had perhaps 30 films which showed Palestinians as, um, as a people who were intent on injuring all Americans. How may we help you, Jad? One of the most despicable portrayals of Arabs and Palestinians occurs in the 1987 film Death Before Dishonor. First, they murder a guard and then slaughter an Israeli family. They kidnap and torture an American Marine and in cold blood execute another. And they burn the American flag right in front of the American embassy and then dispatch a suicide bomber to blow it up. One reason we've not been allowed to empathize with any Palestinian uh, on, on, on the silver screen is, is due to two Israeli producers, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. These two filmmakers created an American company called Canon, and they released in a period of 20 years at least 30 films which vilify all things Arab, particularly Palestinians. They even came out with a film called Hell Squad showing Vegas showgirls trouncing Arabs in the middle of the desert. I mean, the, the, the Vegas showgirls, I think, uh, is, is a good way to wrap up the Golden Globus film. Uh, you know, these were, of course, aimed at uh, teenagers. They're all B-minus films but very, very successful movies. There are a couple of myths that American filmmakers, television producers, as well as some Israelis uh, perpetuated. One was a land without a people, uh, that, that there are no Palestinians. Uh, two, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And three, the only Palestinians that exist uh, are terrorists. Now, if we fast forward to today, and this really disturbs me. Well, let's go back to 1996. Uh, 1996 was the first real Israeli introduction uh, to American television. And that's when CBS TV introduced Ziva David, who was a Mossad agent to a very successful series called NCIS. Not only did David wear a Star of David, she also wore an IDF uniform to show the military influence on her character. Harvard University professor Etienne Kensky identified David as, quote, the most prominent televisual Israeli in the United States. Her depiction was praised for exposing the Western public to Israeli society and culture, its positive portrayal of an Israeli, and its cheerleading role in promoting the ties between the United States and Israel. Now here she is working with American agents, not only killing Arabs and Arab American and Muslim American terrorists here, 
but throughout the world, even in Israel. There's one episode where she goes to Israel and, and kills some of the most ugly Palestinians. I, I can't watch it again. I mean, I, I, I watch so many TV shows and films, but, but this one took the cake. Anyway, that, that show lasted for nine years. Now, can you imagine, there was no press on this, if two filmmakers called Hishmi and Hunedi created Canon Films, and vilified Jews and Israelis the way Golan and Glob Globus vilified Arabs and Palestinians, what the press might have been like. And, and why didn't the producer of NCIS include a Palestinian heroine working with NCIS? You know, call her Leila Rafidi. So Leila and Neva, they could have done the Dubki and the Hora all at the same time. But no, 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 we have to have this biased point of view over and over again. I've been talking about this issue for more than four decades now. I gave my first speech at the American University in April of 1975. And what I keep trying to hammer home gently, very gently, is entertainment acts as propaganda. We don't see it as propaganda. We think it's mere fluff. The films of Leni Reifenstahl in Nazi Germany were more effective the Germans' propaganda films. So we cannot look at these films in a vacuum and think, you know, it's, they're, they're pure fluff. If we fast forward to today, there are two Israeli producers, Avi Nir and Gideon Raff, responsible for some of the most horrific anti-Arab shows I've seen in my life. Tyrant, Dig, and Homeland. Homeland, you know, it's sort of like 24 for grown-ups. I understand the Israeli version is much better than this one. If you haven't seen Tyrant, don't. It's, it's been renewed for another season. It's all about this mythical Arab country where Arabs kill Arabs, slaughter Arabs. The one brother, you know, seduces women while the family watches, even rapes his daughter-in-law. Dig is set in Jerusalem. You'd never know there were Arabs in Jerusalem at all. They, they don't appear, except last week, they did appear. They attacked the car, you know, with one of our diplomats, beat up our diplomat and the Israeli driver. That's the only time in four episodes I've seen a Palestinian, except for one guy called Khalid, who runs from place to place. And if you see the movie Dig, and not Dig, yeah, it's the Brad Pitt movie. I'm sorry. Um, it's, again, in that film, they say, um, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's World War Z. I don't know if you've seen World War Z or not. But, but that, again, is a, is a theme that's repeated over and over again. So there has been no press on this Israeli presence and how they portray Arabs on American television, these two producers. And they convey a very hard line, a very biased perspective of how Arabs are perceived, how we think of Arabs. Last night before going to bed, I flicked on the TV channel because I couldn't sleep, and I was watching The Blacklist. And there's a key player in The Blacklist, a Mossad agent, who wiped out some Iranian terrorists. <laughs> you know, and so this, what we talked about earlier today, what my distinguished panelists have brought about in terms of a presence of government Government, our government working with Israelis, holds true as well in the entertainment industry. So let me conclude. I need my glasses for this because I wrote it down and I can't remember it. So here we go. I want to conclude on an optimistic note. Joseph Lowry, a humble man, champion of civil rights. Uh, this was at President Barack Hussein Obama's inauguration. It reminds us that those who have vilified Arabs and Muslims in the past have the ability to eliminate them. They just need to embrace the wisdom of Lowry. Quote, Lord, help us to make choices on the side of love, not hate, on the side of inclusion, not exclusion, tolerance, not intolerance, and help us work for that day when black will not be asked to get in the back, when brown can stick around, when yellow will be mellow, when the red man can get ahead, man, I, and I added this phrase, and when the Israeli and Arab man get it right and see the light and refuse to fight. 
I began with those who tell the stories rule society. When we begin to tell the stories, American and Israeli filmmakers, when we begin to tell stories, now more than ever before, fresh new stories, stories that shatter stereotypes, stories that humanize the people, stories that conquer fear, stories that create new ways of seeing, new ways of thinking and feeling. When we create those stories, we will crush hate and advance peace and sort of remind ourselves that all humankind is truly one family in the care of God. Thank you very much. That again was Dr. Jack Shaheen, uh, who provided us the uh, Las Vegas review. Thank you. Uh, time for questions. and. Um, we have uh, uh, many questions. Uh, why don't we start uh, here, and um, we'll expend our time with uh, Dr. Rothschild. Or should I do all of them? And uh, do one why don't you do a couple, and then, okay. then we'll go. Dr. Falk has uh, many questions directed to him, and uh, I think I have one question also for okay. uh, Dr. Shaheen. But we'll start with Dr. Alice Rothschild. So, and okay, so I'm going to address a couple of questions. I just want to say on the issue of the um, oh, action. Let me interrupt. I'm sorry. Sorry? I apologize. I had a note. I left it. Please remind, be reminded that Jack Shaheen will be signing his book after this panel at 11.45. And um, that's uh, a commercial from our sponsor. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's Thank okay. You. And I'm signing my book at 1.05. No commercial, though. Um, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I just wanted to add to that. Um, the uh, action film called Dig, which is filmed in East Jerusalem. Um, there were over 20 uh, Palestinian uh, civil group society activist uh, groups that protested the filming of the film in East Jerusalem. And what people don't know is that the Israeli government and Jerusalem municipality gave the film people $6.2 million grant to make that film. So this is also Israeli propaganda, Hasbara, stuff going on, but that wasn't the question. So the first question is what is anti-Semitism, which is a fabulous question, and um, how does it relate to Zionism? So let me give you the two minute answer to something that people write PhD theses on. Um, the way I define anti-Semitism is hating Jews because they are Jews, and that that's, that's the, only re the, the main reason to hate them or the organization they're in or whatever. So how does Zionism mesh with being Jewish? So if you look historically at Zionism for you know, a billion years, there was sort of a religious Zionism, the Zionism of my Orthodox grandfather. It was a messianic sometime, some, you know, who knows when the Messiah will come. And it was that kind of religious, mythical Zionism. It wasn't actually meant to, that something would actually happen in the near future. And then um, in the uh, late 1800s with Herzl and the first Zionist Congress, there was an increasing uh, movement amongst uh, Eastern European intellectuals um, to respond to the horrific amount of Christian anti-Semitism that occurred in Europe. And they, along with all sorts of other groups that were having movements of nationalism, so it's in that context of nationalism, and also in the context of colonialism, uh, developed the idea that the Jews needed an actual place to go to be safe. Um, they were kind of vaguely helped by the British Empire that promised the same piece of land to the Arabs and the Jews. Um, and I think one of the things to remember is that Lord Balfour, with the Balfour Declaration, had Christian Zionist tendencies. So there were a lot of sort of anti-Semitic reasons why colonial powers wanted to get rid of their Jews and put them someplace else. Um, there was actually a tremendous debate within uh, the Jewish intellectual community. Uh, I put Martin Buber on one side and Herzl on the other. You know, uh, should there be an actual place? Should it be in Uganda? Should it be in Palestine? Should it be a binational state? Should it be a Jewish-only state? I mean, this was a major, major debate, and I think it's important to understand that. Um, the people who wanted a Jewish-only state won out, and sort of the rest is history. So at this point, when I use the word Zionism, I'm referring to a political 
political Zionism as it is currently practiced. And the way I define it as currently practiced is a belief that Jews, for either historical, Holocaust, biblical, whatever reasons, um, deserve or must have a state that is for Jews and that privileges Jewish people over everybody else. And um, that that is what's going on in uh, Israel right now and in the occupied territories. So um, the reason that I think it is really important to separate Jews from Zionists is that, first of all, many Jews are not Zionists. Zionism is a political movement that I think, in retrospect, has had really catastrophic implications, both to non-Jews and to Jews. And I would argue that political Zionism, as it is now practiced, is incredibly dangerous to Jews. So that creating, you know, when I look at the state of Israel and I look at the policies of the state of Israel, I can't find anything Jewish about it except singing Hatikva in Hebrew. I mean, seriously. And when I, you know, I'm at a checkpoint and there's some 20-year-old pointing a big gun at me and you know, accusing all the civilian Palestinian women that I'm surrounded by of something, this is not Jewish. This is not Jewish values. It is not Jewish history. It's just not related to any of my understanding of what it means to be a Jew. So I put that under Zionism and under political Zionism and under occupation and under oppressing some other peoples because they're not Jewish. And even in the state of Israel, 20% of the citizens are Palestinians and they are second class citizens. They get less of everything. And so for me, um, founding a state that by definition privileges Jews over everybody else is doomed a, to ca chronic catastrophe and ultimately to failure. And I think that's very different than Jews as a religion or an ethnicity or as a culture. So that's why I keep those very, very separate. <laughs> Uh, I thank you for a series of questions uh, which I cannot do justice to, but let me um, at least uh, address one that I think is uh, raises a very important question, and uh, the question asks, Israel has ignored with impunity numerous UN resolutions. Why has there been no uh, effort in the General Assembly uh, to decertify Israel from the UN. In effect, uh, there is no constitutional veto in the General Assembly, and the great majority of governments in the world are highly critical of Israel. But what I think one doesn't understand, and I probably didn't make clear enough in my uh, remarks is that in addition to the constitutional veto that exists within the UN Charter and the way in which the structure of the UN is set up, there has emerged a geopolitical veto which uh, paralyzes the organization at the level of implementation. See, the, U the UN General Assembly can say what it wants. It can declare things. It can uh, propose fact-finding uh, inquiries into the attacks on Gaza of the sort that the Goldstone reported, but it's incapable of implementing the recommendations that follow from those initiatives or of uh, enforcing or uh, achieving compliance with its resolutions. And that's because the UN was created with the idea that it is an instrument of statecraft, not an alternative to it. And it's very important, the UN is very important symbolically and in waging this struggle to control the heights of international law and morality, which mobilize people. There wouldn't be a BDS movement or an anti-apartheid campaign if there hadn't been a UN to create a consensus that what Israel is doing and what South Africa was doing were uh, violation, fundamental violations not only of international law, 
but of the most basic ideas of international morality and constitute, in effect, crimes against humanity. But that a consciousness, see, the UN is important for mobilizing a moral consciousness around the world, but it's incapable due to its structure and due to the way in which world order is organized on a global basis to create the behavioral uh, changes that that moral consciousness calls for. That depends on civil society. And there is this growing realization, I think, that governments are not going to solve this problem and that the UN cannot solve this problem, that it will depend on the mobilization of people. And that's why, in my view, uh, these, uh, the, the growing global solidarity movement and the organizations like uh, Jewish Voices for Peace and the BDS campaign are so important at this stage of the struggle. Okay, so I'm being asked, what is the New York Police Department doing in Israel? And there are no blacks there to kill except the Ethiopian Jews. So first of all, that's not quite correct. Um, there are Sudanese and Eritrean asylum seekers who are black who are subjected to horrific amount of racism. So there are blacks to kill. But uh, that's not the answer. So the thing that you need to understand is that what um, sort of the Israeli PR is, is that one of their biggest products is security and that they really know how to do crowd control. I mean, they've been occupying a whole ton of people for decades now, and so they have the expertise to do crowd control and to fight terrorism. And when you sort of investigate this a little bit, not only do they have the most advanced weaponry mostly from us, but they have developed a huge system of collaborators and sort of, um, a malicious kind of security system to keep a population under control. So what our American cities want to do is to learn how to control us. They want to learn how to control protests and crowds. They want to learn how to fight, quote, terrorism, as it is getting more and more broadly defined. And Israel is supposed to have the best product. So that's what our policemen are doing in Israel. The other thing that is very, very um, worrisome, I think, is, for instance, if you look at the wall between the US and Mexico, uh, that is partly built by an Israeli company because they're also really good at building walls to keep people out or in or whatever they're doing. So, um, and the thing that gets even more messy about this whole thing is that um, our US military now has all this excess equipment now that we're not actively killing a whole bunch of people, we're just kind of doing it more slowly. So the military is now giving our police departments tanks and you know things you might need to do if you're doing traffic in Idaho or something. So we have a police that are weaponized by our excess military equipment that are trained in Israel, and that means that we are all at risk. So I always like to remind people that this is not some you know, little conflict off in some crazy country, this is gonna come to bite us. The reason that we have our Fergusons and all the black men that are just assassinated, shoot to kill, is for a reason. And these are the kind of forces uh, that go into making that uh, true in our society. We have uh, lights, red lights are flashing, tones are beeping, it is time for us to take a break uh, as uh, much as we might want to hear more, uh, it is time for us to take a break, and I think we should stick with our discipline and uh, carry on as the previous panel did and not be a bad example for those who have yet to speak. So please uh, take a break. Uh, Dr. Falk will be signing books in 10 minutes, and um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here.